Hello and welcome to this week's Sparta Live event. Γεια σας. Καλώς ορίσατε σε ένα ακόμα επεισόδιο της σειράς Sparta Live. I'm Chrysanthi Gallu, Assistant Professor of Aegean Archaeology at the University of Nottingham and Director of the University Center for Spartan and Peloponnesian Studies. My co-host is Dr. Petros Dukas, the Mayor of Sparty. Go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here, obedient to their laws, we lie. Two and a half thousand years since the Battle of Thermopylae, we commemorate the self-sacrifice of a group of few brave warriors who gave their lives for the benefit of the many. I also remember fondly my grandfather Vasilis telling me how one died matters as much as one how one lived and as how one is being remembered. And this is the theme of our event today, death and commemoration in ancient Sparta and Greece around the time of the 300. And it is appropriate to remember today and pay tribute to our dear friend and former colleague John Salmon, who died recently. John held academic posts at Queen's Belfast and the University of Lancaster before moving to the University of Nottingham in the late 80s where he remained until his retirement in 2008. Many of you know of his great research on wealthy Corinth, among his many other significant contributions in ancient Greek history. He was an inspiring teacher and colleague who will be warmly remembered by so many. He was one of the first members of the Center for Spartan and Peloponnesian Studies, and his kind heart and big smile shall be missed by all of us. Farewell, John. I should now turn over to my co-host, Dr. Dukas, for the introduction of today's guest speakers and session. Petros, over to you. Chrysanthi, thank you. Hello to everybody and welcome. It is my turn uh, today and now to welcome you in uh, today's live event. As a mayor of the city of Sparta, please allow me very briefly to boast that we consider Sparta to be the birthplace of Republican democracy. We consider Sparta to be the birthplace of constitutional monarchy, like the one you have in the United Kingdom, the birthplace of a Senate and the concept of a Senate, the birthplace of free public education, and also the birthplace of a, some sort of political thought that says that a a society would last longer if there is an economic equality 28 centuries 27 centuries before Karl Marx uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's guest speakers who will be talking to us about burial and commemoration around the time of the 300 Spartans today we're honored to have with us professors Polly Lowe and Paul Christensen Polly is a leading historian of ancient Greece at the University of Durham, with particular interests in the political history of the classical Greek world and in the history and ideology of Greek interstate relations. She is particularly interested in the commemoration of the war dead in classical Greece. And among the, her great scholarly achievements, she has published on the power and commemoration of the dead in ancient Sparta in 2006 and 2011. Today, she will discuss the expectations and customs surrounding the treatment of the war dead in the Greek world outside Sparta. How the Spartans buried the dead and how that compares to burial practices in other nearby city states will be discussed by our other guest speaker. Professor Paul Christensen. Paul is William Cannon Professor of Ancient Greek History in the Department of Classics at Dartmouth University in the USA. His areas of expertise include ancient Greek history with particular focus on Sparta, sport history, including the ancient Olympics and their relationship between sport and political systems. With regards to Sparta, he recently published a new book, a new reading of the Damon on Stele. And he's currently working with Paul Cartledge of Cambridge University on the Oxford history of the archaic Greek world and a volume on archaic Sparta and Laconia. A warm welcome to both. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Paul 
to take the stage first. Paul, the stage is yours. Thank you. And let me start by saying thank you to Chrysanthi and to Mayor Dukas uh, for the putting in all the work to host these events. We all miss the opportunity to see each other in person in various ways, shapes and forms. And so this is a, a great opportunity for us to get together even remotely and make connections that otherwise wouldn't be possible. So thank you so much for, for your Xenia. So well, I will talk today very briefly about Spartiate burial customs. There's a lot we could say. We'll just sort of scratch the surface to talk about what's new, and then there'll be some time for Q&A. So I'll start by just very briefly talking about uh, some background information that one might need, the terminology, geography, the literary evidence, and the history of excavations in Sparta. So if we can take the next slide. There we go. So just a, as a really quick terminological review, there were basically three socio-political categories in the ancient Spartan state. There were Spartiates, who were full male citizens and their families who lived in and around the city of Sparta. There were Perioikoi, who were free individuals who lived in small communities on the edges of the Spartan state, and Helots, enslaved individuals who lived throughout the Spartan state. And so we'll focus today on burials from the city of Sparta which means that the burials in question were predominantly those of Spartiates, as opposed to the Prioikoi and Helots, which we won't talk about today. And if we can go to the next slide, that's the terminology. Here is the geography. By around 600 BCE, Sparta was a clearly defined urban center with four residential clusters. They're roughly indicated here, the four village names. You can see Patani, Mesoa, Kinosora, and Limni and a single temple for the patron deity on the Acropolis and a single agora. So there was a coherent, a coherent urban area. And that urban area had strong geographic boundaries on three sides, the Eurotus on the east, the Maglodica stream on the west, and the Muska ravine on the north. And if we can take the next slide, there we go. Well, when a wall was event, when the Spartans eventually built a wall in the third century BCE, it followed those geographical boundaries. And when the Spartans built cemeteries, they built them precisely on the edges of that space. So we just want to have a sense for where the cemeteries were in relation to the urban core, and that map should help us with that. Now, as we'll as we'll see, up until very recently, very few burials from in and around the city of Sparta had been excavated. And as a result, up until very recently, what we knew about Spartan burial practice came almost exclusively from a very limited number of passages in the ancient Greek literary sources. And if we can take the next slide. I won't go through those sources with you here today in the interest of brevity, but the sources tell us that there were no inscribed monuments for the deceased except soldiers who died in war and women who had religious office, that the graves for everyone were quite simple. There were no grave goods for soldiers except their military cloak and olive leaves. And most importantly, that intramural burial was permitted in order to dissolve notions of pollution springing from contact with the dead. And that the Spartans willingness to countenance intramural burial has been seen as very unique because most Greeks starting around 700 BCE seem to have been insistent, at least this has been the traditional story have been insistent on burying their dead on the edges of town away from the everyday residential space. So, and we'll come back and talk some more about that. And so that's the literary evidence. And let's talk very briefly about the excavations in Sparta, the history of excavations, and then we come back and talk about actual burial practice. So the first extended excavation program in Sparta was undertaken by the British school in the early years of the 20th century. Uh, can we have the next slide? And their work is focused on establishing the line of the city walls, and they focused on three sanctuaries, the Athena Hakioiko Sanctuary, you can see on the northern end of town, Artemis Orthia on the east end of town near the river, and the Menelaean to the southeast of Sparta. And you can note that the British excavators stayed largely off the grid of the modern city, which of the uh, modern city, which sits directly on top of the ancient city. And in 10 seasons of digging, the British excavators found only about a half dozen graves. And the obvious question they asked themselves is why were they not finding any big cemeteries? And the answer that they proposed was that the literary sources said that everyone had been buried intramurally within the bounds of the urban center, and that therefore those intramural graves must have been destroyed by later building activity. And that's why we weren't finding any graves. 
And after the British finished excavating in Sparta in 1928, relatively little excavation took place. The Greek Archaeological Service carried out intermittent rescue excavations in Sparta, but those were relatively few in number because for a relatively long period of time, only the Acropolis was a protected archaeological site. A small Roman cemetery was found on the north side of town in the 1930s, and a small uh, early Christian cemetery was found in the middle of town in the 1960s when the vegetable market was built. And so uh, what all this meant is that the, most of the ancient city of Sparta remained largely unexcavated until quite recently, and we had very little archaeological evidence for how Sparta is buried their dead. And a major change came, if we can take the next slide, came in 1994-1995 when archaeological protection was extended to the entire area of the ancient city of Sparta. And what that meant was there was a, that coincided with a building boom in the city of Sparta and the number of rescue excavations in the city increased very substantially starting in 1994-1995. And those excavations produced a lot, a lot of new evidence for archaeological evidence for how Sparta is buried their dead. And so if you take the next slide, there we go. Um, in the various uh, ex various cemeteries uh, came, were, uh, were found starting in 19, uh, those excavations in 1994. And so a big Roman cemetery was found on the west side of town in the 1990s. And then in 2008 and 2009, uh, under the leadership of Dr. Maria Tsuli, a, a, a smaller but earlier cemetery of, with 69 graves from the er archaic through early Hellenistic period was found. And the cem there's this, the cemetery on the Roman cemetery on the north side of Sparta now looks to be bigger. So uh, we now have lots and lots of burials from Sparta. The majority of those burials are Roman. I won't talk about those today, only because the Roman burials in Sparta look like the Roman burials in the rest of Greece. And so while they're extremely interesting, they don't immediately enormously add to our knowledge of Greek burial practice. But the cemetery with 69 Spartia graves from the archaic through early Hellenistic was quite a revelation. So let, let's talk about that one and focus on that one. Um, some highlights from the from that finds from that cemetery. One is that no grave markers of any kind were found. So, uh, exactly like we would expect from the literary sources, there were no grave markers. And the interesting, which is fits very well with what we know from the literary sources. There were, however, a periboloi. If we can take the next slide. So, in the lower levels of the cemetery, the tombs were grouped in clusters and surrounded by rectangular enclosures made from medium-sized stones. And you can see that that's called the, the one enclosure that's been fully excavated is Peribolus A, and it had ultimately 14 graves in it. So we now know for the first time that Spart Spartiates were burying their dead in, in, in grave enclosures in some sort of presumably family groups, which is this had just never been apparent to us before. And if we can take the next slide, another new feature of this is that particular Peribolus we just looked at, Peribolus A, centered around a horse burial, which comes, which came as a great surprise to everybody. The horse that was buried there was placed in a specially built grave built from river stones. It's not the only horse burial in the cemetery. In this small area of the cemetery, which has been excavated, which is not all of it, uh, five horse burials were found. And all, all the horses did not die from natural causes. Uh, they all were slaughtered. There was no trace of fire on the bones so that they, were, they weren't sacrificed and eaten. They seem to have been sacrificed and specifically built as the center of long-term family, uh, family burial centers, which is a pretty remarkable uh, fe uh, feature of Spartiate burials, which is very rare in the Greek world and certainly comes as a revelation for how the Spartans, Spartans were burying their dead. So I'll leave it at that, except to say that we want to take just a little bit, think for just literally one minute about what we now know about Spartiate burial practice that we didn't know 10 years or 20 years ago. Part of it is that the Spartiates did not, in fact, bury all of their dead intramurally, that the Spartiates were building big, uh, big cemeteries starting in the archaic period, so starting around 700 BC and perhaps even earlier on the edges of town. And if we take a look at the next slide, the current orthodoxy is, if we went back 10 years, was that uh, 
in the arc starting around 700 BC, all other Greek communities buried all of their dead extramurally on the edge of town. And the Spartiates were the exception. They buried all of their dead intramurally. That's what we used to think. And we now know that's not true. We know that the Spartans were burying their dead both within the town and on the outside of town. We know that because the rescue excavations have found not only extramural cemeteries, but lots and lots of burials inside of the urban fabric too. And that comes as a revelation for that. We wouldn't have expected that anyone would, any Greek group would be burying both intramurally and extramurally simultaneously in the archaic period, if we can take the next slide, but that turns out to be the way the Spartans were doing things. And I'll, I'll close by saying that it, the recent excavations that the, have been carried out in places like Argos and Corinth now show that that, that practice of burying both intramurally and extramurally simultaneously is now well attested in Sparta, Argos, and Corinth. And more and more, our sense, uh, it looks like Athens, which had been always taken as the norm, where people were almost all buried in extramural cemeteries, Athens looks like the outlier. And Sparta, the Spartan practice, looks more and more like what was common, at least in the Peloponnese, where people are buried partially in extramural cemeteries and partially in intramural graves located along major roadways. And I'll, I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Polly. Thank you so much. Hi, is it me? Well, my box still says I'm live, but I'm done. So, I, so <laughs> I'm happy to sort of <laughs> entertain, but I think we, we need to... to um, yeah, there we go. Right. We turn things over to Professor Lowe. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Paul. And, and thank you also to Gazanti and to, the, to Mayor Dukas for the, for the invitation. So, so my task slightly uh, paradoxically for this, this series perhaps is to talk about not Sparta, uh, but the aim, as, as I think you've already said, is to, to do that to try and get a better sense of, of what is and isn't distinctive about what, what's happening um, inside Sparta. Um, as is often the case when people say they're talking about the Greek world, they're really talking about Athens, and that, that's what I'll do. But one advantage of Athens is that we, we do at least have quite a lot of, of evidence for it. So I'll try and sort of pick up where Paul left off, if we can have the first, first slide. Um, real, thank you very much. Um, Athen Athenian practice, um, when it comes to burying their dead, if we start with the, the non-war dead, the people who die with their boots off, so to speak, which sort of, um, I guess, is the, the closest parallel to what we've been looking at in Sparta just now. Um, in Athens, as as we now can see in Sparta, the family is is very important in in how burial takes place. So here's an example from an Athenian law court speech of the middle of the fourth century. As is usually the case, by the time something gets to the Athenian law courts, it's because stuff isn't working as it should. But we can ex we can tell from this incident how things are meant to work in Athens. And one advantage of our slightly better literary sources for for Athens is that we can see a little bit what how what happens before someone gets into the grave? So what's happened here is that a man called Euctemon has died uh, of old age. Um, some bad people are trying to get their hands on Euctemon's stuff. So they're sort of frustrating the proper burial process here. Um, and in particular, stopping the women of Euctemon's family from performing the proper burial or pre-burial rites in this instance. So what we can see happening here is that what should be going on is that Euctemon's daughters and his wife should find out that he's died and then be allowed to go in and perform the initial rituals for him inside the house. And then if we go to the, the next slide, um, what would happen? Uh, we're, we're not with Euctemon anymore. We never find out, I think, exactly what happens to him. But in Athens, an individual who died um, at home uh, would be taken outside the city. Um, or outside their settlement if we're in, in the deems, 
Um, buried probably in a family enclosure, so this is also a feature of Athenian um, burial of, of individuals. Um, in Athens, unlike in Sparta, at least certainly from the latter part of the 5th century, uh, it's, it seems to be commonplace that burials would be marked with some sort of marker, a permanent, uh, usually stone marker of various forms. The one I'm showing you, this is a bit of self-indulgence because this is, for those of us who can't get to Greece at the moment, uh, this is a uh, an Athenian uh, grave marker currently located in, in Derbyshire, in the, in the middle of, of England at, at Chatsworth House. Um, but the other reason for showing it to you is because it illustrates quite well um, the sort of family dynamics in Athenian burial and commemoration of, of individuals. So this commemorates a man called Pyrrhos, son of Pancles of the Dean Potamos, and presumably his wife, uh, whose name isn't preserved, uh, daughter of someone blank, Sostrasos again, the full name isn't preserved, of Kefale, so two southern Athenian deems, and this probably stood somewhere uh, in, in southern Attica before it was purloined uh, by a British aristocrat and, and moved to Derbyshire. So for an individual, uh, a sort of private individual, the route to the, to the grave involved the family and involved probably burial in the family enclosure and uh, some sort of permanent commemoration. Um, however, the other thing, the other way that one could get commemorated in Athens and in the Greek world is it has a much greater role for the state. So if we go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether we can say a common way to die, but certainly a not a not uncommon way to die in the Greek world is to, to die in warfare. Um, by the classical period, Possibly earlier on, exactly when these conventions start is still, I think, open to question. There is a pretty well established set of expectations for what ha what should happen to you if you die in battle. Certainly, what happens in the immediate aftermath of the battle, which, as far as we can see from the literary sources, are held to across the Greek world. So, Athenians, Spartans, Corinthians, um, everyone seems to subscribe, at least in theory, to these expectations. So what you've got on the slide is an example chosen more or less at random, actually. Um, there are many examples um, in, in the pages of various histories. So this is from the Peloponnesian War from Thucydides. Battle has happened. The Athenians believe that they've won. When you win a battle, you, you get control of the space in which the battle was fought and everything in it. So that your own dead and the dead of the enemy. You can, as the Athenians do here, remove the armor from the dead enemy but you leave the bodies and you take up your own bodies. The twist in the story here is that the Athenians, it turns out, haven't won as comprehensively as they thought they had. The Corinthians come back, the Athenians have to retreat and leave a couple of their own dead behind, but they're able to send a herald. Um, and even though there's still clearly a state of conflict between the two sides, there's an expectation that their herald can go and retrieve all of the Athenian dead and the Athenians can take uh, the dead away from the battlefield. What happens to what you do with your dead once you've got them off the battlefield varies between polis. Um, some, in some occasions they're buried on the battlefield, sometimes I think normal Spartan practice is to take them a bit, take them to the closest sort of safe place, the closest friendly territory, and some states take them all the way back home. And the normal Athenian practice is to repatriate their war dead all the way back to Athens. However, there are always exceptions, and the one I'm going to close with is maybe the most famous exception of all. So if we look at the next slide, this brings us back to the Persian Wars, um, the Athenian dead uh, at Marathon. Um, now, as you all know, the Athenians suffer relatively light casualties at the Battle of Marathon, 192, but they bury them in a, an an unusual way, a way which is unusual in, in many respects, and which was noticed by near contemporaries as being unusual. So when Thucydides talks about uh, the treatment of the dead of Marathon, he, he sig singles it out as an, as an anomaly in, in terms of normal Athenian practice. Um, the form of the burial, as is, you can see on the slide, is distinctive. And it's worth emphasizing that in, by, by 490, this is not a normal way for the Athenians to, to bury their dead. Um, it's not unprecedented, um, but the precedents are 
distinct and sort of remote from from uh, the early fifth century context. So if we look at the next slide, which is what's going on inside the Soros, this is, it was excavated at the end of the of the nineteenth century. Um, the dead were cremated, um, and offerings were made uh, to the dead. So the thing labelled E or Epsilon is an offering trench. It is. There are various sort of models for what the Athenians might have been thinking of, or what particular precedents they might be trying to invoke here. This is, in some respects, this looks like a Homeric or a sort of heroic style of burial, um, but it also has some similarities with uh, burial styles used by uh, uh, aristocratic elites, uh, Athenians in the earlier archaic period. So it could be the Athenians are trying to evoke a uh, sort of Homeric heroic style of burial, but it could be that the, the new democracy is trying to take for itself uh, and sort of democratise uh, a previously elite form of burial, or maybe it's some combination of both. That's something we could maybe talk about in the Q&A. But one last thing I want to bring in, and this is the next slide, is another distinctive feature of this monument, a thing that we always sort of knew was there because the literary sources mentioned it, but until relatively recently, 10 or so years ago, we didn't actually know what these things looked like. And that's the presence of inscribed casualty lists at the Soros at Marathon. So this turned up slightly unexpectedly in the Peloponnese uh, at the villa of Herodes Atticus. Um, it is one of originally presumably 10 lists of the dead arranged according to the Clycenic tribe. So this is the list of the first tribe, the tribe Eric Thais. Something to notice and a difference from the individual monument we looked at before is that all you get on this list is your name. So that, that list of 22 or so names is just the name, no patronymic, no demotic, uh, and the tribe. Um, so I mean some people interpret this as a, again a sort of democratizing move so it takes away any signs of status, but it certainly strips away uh, that family affiliation, which seems to be so important in other types of burial. Um, you are there as a member of your tribe and, and nothing else on this list. And the other thing we can notice, of course, in this uh, stele is the verse epigram, um, which again focuses on the collective and on the, the sort of generic virtues, their arete, their valour, the fact they fought for Athens, there's something I think reminiscent here from the, the bit of Tertius that we looked at briefly last week, uh, these, these sort of heroic collective virtues which are being privileged. Um, so the, the picture we get from, from the marathon burial um, is, is very different from the picture we got from uh, when we looked at Euteman or, or at Pyrrhus's death um, in terms of the style of burial uh, and the things which are being emphasised, the emphasis on, on the collective rather than the individual, although the individual hasn't completely disappeared, I would say. Um, and that's probably more than my time, so I will shut up and hope, hope to have some questions. Uh, thank you very much, Paul and Polly, uh, for such enlightening presentations on the burial practices uh, in Sparta and outside Sparta, and the excellent example with uh, the uh, Marathon Soros. Uh, we have many questions for our guest speakers, as I can see from uh, the from the uh, Q and A. So I'd like to ask Matt Thompson the Secretary of the Center for Spartan and Peloponnesian Studies and our PhD student working on the commemorative monuments of the Spartans uh, to represent our, our attendees and ask the questions collected via email, Twitter and chat on their behalf. But first, I'd like to offer the privilege of host to Dr. Dukas to ask the first question. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chrysanthi. Uh, dear Paul and Polly, really thank you. The city of Sparta is grateful for your fascinating research and uh, insights. We really appreciate that uh, you have earned your visit uh, to Sparta. Um, just uh, to start uh, the questioning, and thank you, Chrysanthi, uh, maybe we start with the concept and the idea of kenotaphs or cenotaphs. The idea that you have a burial ground with no body inside, as the one we have, impressive one, we have in the center of Sparta. Uh, what are the meaning? Are there a lot of them? Uh, what, can, what can you make 
out of it uh, for the story of uh, Spartan life. Maybe Paul, first to you. Sound, sound. My apologies, I muted myself to be polite and then forgot to unmute myself. My internet etiquette is failing me. So um, I said, I'm happy to talk about the Spartan evidence. I'm sure that Polly is much more qualified than I am to talk about the, Spart the evidence from outside of Sparta. So in the center of, of Sparta, there is a, a building, a relatively small one, but made from very impressively large blocks of stone that is known as the tomb of Leonidas. It has been known that it has, it has had that title as far back as I can trace it into the 19th century. There is, however, no certain evidence that that was the tomb of Leonidas or, in fact, that it was a tomb of any kind. The architecture of the building and the construction techniques would put it, uh, so Leonidas was alive and died in 480 BC. The, uh, the design of the building in terms of its materials probably points further back into the 6th century BCE. So while there's no firm evidence to date the building, the building's probably much earlier than Leonidas, and it's more likely to have been a shrine of some sort rather than a, than a cenotaph. So it's, no one knows for certain. The archaeological evidence is just there's very little of it for that building. But if you ask me, I would be inclined to say it's not a grave of any kind, probably a religious shrine from a period at least 100 years earlier than Leonidas. And I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Polly. Um, I mean, yes, I, uh, there are, the short answer is there are such things as, as cenotaphs. Um, so an example, uh, a well-known example from Athens would be the, the cenotaph of, of Dexalaeus, which we know is a cenotaph partly because it's, it's been excavated, but also because we know he must have been, he died in the Corinthian War, and we know he would have been buried in the collective grave or his cremated remains would have been in the uh, collective grave um, but his family wanted to put up a spectacular monument to him in their family grave enclosure um, so that would be one motivation for creating a cenotaph if uh, for some reason the, you don't have access to the body but you want to create a monument um, and there are there are references i think also in in the anabasis um, there's an occasion when Xenophon's unable to retrieve the bodies of the dead, but wants to create a monument to, to the dead uh, and to create a cenotaph. So it's definitely a, an attested phenomenon in the Greek world, even if we can't pin one down for Sparta. By the way, if I may interject, the cenotaph of Leonidas is the place where we have our national day celebrations. March 26, October 28, when we have the bands and the raising of the flag and the national anthem, that's all in front of uh, the cenotaph. And it's, it has been accepted that this is the place. Back to you. Thank you very much uh, to Paul and Polly. Uh, I've I've witnessed what the mayor says with the national celebrations in, uh, in front of the so-called tomb of Leonidas. Um, and I think the explanation that Paul has given us and Polly about the cenotaphs could give a new insight of how we could be looking into certain monuments that the tradition attributes names to them, but then it's up to the archaeologists and the scholars to uh, give some insights into the use uh, of these um, of these monuments. But I think people are getting really anxious of having their questions heard so and asked. So I will now uh, turn over to Matt, who will be asking the questions on behalf of our attendees. Thank you, Matt. All right, thank you. Uh, we've got lots of questions pouring in, so I'm really sorry if I don't get to yours this evening. Um, so a very popular one that, that we're seeing is uh, about discrepancies between uh, free and unfree burials and whether this is 
visible in either the Spartan evidence or elsewhere in Greece. So if we come to Professor Christensen first, can we see a difference between uh, Spartiate and Helot burials um, in the new excavations? It is a great question. Uh, the problem is that we don't know what Helot burials look like. The burials that have been excavated so far in and around Sparta have been right on the edge of Sparta or in the town itself. Our presumption and in the cemeteries that were on the edges of Sparta, they were ferociously reused so that graves were built on top of graves in very short time periods. There seems to have been limited space to bury. So our presumption is under those circumstances, the burials we're looking at were burials of Spartiates, that the Helots would not have had access to that very high use, high demand space. So the answer, the short answer is we just don't know what Helot burials look like. It is a fantastic question. It's one of those archeological questions that if you ask me the things I would love, if I could just sort of conjure, would be an archeological dig of a Helot settlement with Helot burials and a Perioikic cemetery too. We just don't know. But on the other hand, if we walk back even not very long ago, like it's like 20 years ago, we didn't know anything substantive in terms of archaeological evidence for even Sparty burial. So uh, the Greek Archaeological Service d d deserves all credit for the incredible work that they've done on the last 20 years. And I think there's good hope that if we have some patience, we'll be able to answer that question. Uh, excellent. And Professor Lowe, if we could come to you with the same kind of question, but a bit more broadly in Greece and in Athens, can we see any differences mm. there? Uh, well, yeah, again, I'm, I can't think of a a good sort of archaeological example, but an example that comes to mind from from Attica is a grave monument from from Lavrion, from the mining region, um, set up by a man called Atotas, who seem is a describes himself as a Paphlagonian, so it seems very likely to be a mining slave. Whether he was still a slave when he died, or whether he had was was free by that point, but that's an interesting case and there are some some other possible examples of either slaves or, or recently freed slaves sort of emulating the the burial practices of free or citizen Athenians um but again it's, it's hard to it's hard to pin down status from from burial evidence um, I would just add one yeah. just add one thing really briefly again so I don't know should I I don't know if there we so I would just add really briefly, just to add to one thing that Polly said, is the Greek Archaeological Service has excavated this enormous big cemetery in Phaleron as part of the Nearchos Center mm -hmm. being built down there. And the preliminary finds would suggest that a lot of those burials are from lower and from the lower end of the socioeconomic period. I think the last time I saw there were about 1,200 burials, some very high status, including horse burials, but many from the other end of the socioeconomic spectrum have not been published yet in, in anything we're near a uh, full way. So there again, I think there's forthcoming evidence that will be extremely helpful in expanding our, our knowledge. It's one of those things, lots of times students ask, don't we, hasn't everything been excavated already? And people who do this for a living always laugh. It's like, you, we haven't even scratched the surface. There's, and so this is one of those frontiers, I would say is burial evidence for people from lower down the socioeconomic spectrum. Wonderful, thank you uh, for, for those two. Uh, we also have our very popular questions at the moment. Uh, both seem to be about the Periboiloi tombs. Uh, and in particular, uh, if you could say any more about the fact that these are family groups, uh, how we know that, do we have any more information on the skeletal assemblages? Has there been any uh, DNA done? And do we have a, a date for when they're constructed and when they go out of use? So, uh, Professor Christensen, I think we should go to you on this one. Right, okay. There we go. Okay, so the, let's try to take them all in order. So how do we know they're family tombs? At the moment, uh, that is a supposition. It's hard to see what other social groups they might correspond to. The bones have been sent out for study. They have not come back yet. I imagine that the DNA analysis will be done as well. The, uh, the preliminary publication of that cemetery from the archaic and classical cemetery in Sparta came in 2013. The rest of the work is proceeding in terms of the ceramic evidence and all the other, all the bone, the osteological evidence. It's unclear when we'll see that, but I think we're all excited about 
about that evidence being studied in more detail. In terms of the date, Pergolus A dates to the sixth century BCE. So, uh, you know, by, so in that period, um, the cemetery, there are the finds from the cemetery suggest that it may have been as, in use as early as the ninth or eighth century BCE. But because there was such ferocious rebuilding, the lower level graves were sort of destroyed by the earlier graves. But then they built up, up, up as they sort of as they built one grave on top of the other. So the early, the Priboloi, the earliest ones date to the archaic period, although there is some reason to believe that they may go back earlier than that. I think that covered everything. There were all sorts of parts of that question. I have to confess to being very Spartan. And so I, it was a long question and I lost track of the beginning. <laughs> May I interject uh, a question, Chrysanthi? Any distinguishable characteristics on the decision for cremation versus burial of a uh, full body? In what cases do you have more of a cremation and in what cases do you have uh, the whole body being buried? Is there some rule there or or percentages of numbers? I wait till I'm I think I need to wait until I'm back in the red box. Do I or should I? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, so this is another really interesting piece of information. It's a great question. So in Athens, there was a cycling back and forth between a preference for inhumation, just burying the body versus cremation and cremating the body first. It turns out that in Sparta and in the Peloponnese in general, cremation is extremely rare before the Hellenistic period, before around say uh, before around 200 BCE. There's very little evidence for cremation anywhere in the Peloponnese. The Spartans just didn't. Uh, the Spartans and the Argives, the Corinthians, just weren't doing that. So um, the that's just a, a different pattern from Sparta. I would say, just as an aside. One question which we have asked ourselves and to which we don't have an answer yet is we have both extramural and intramural burials from Sparta in the same time period. So a, a, a question we would love to know the answer is why were some people burying inter, extramurally and some people buried intramurally? Why were some people being buried in the center of the settlement along the major roads, the major roads? And why were some people buried at the edge of town? And um, pretty much any theory you have is now totally feasible because it's all just sort of up in the air interpretively. Uh, just, maybe just, Chrysanthi, uh, if you allow me. P uh, Plutarch in the life of Lycurgo says that Lycurgus encouraged burials in the city. People were afraid of the dead that somehow had them outside the city. Mm -hmm. And Lycurgus himself encouraged them and they started burying uh, Spartans inside the city. Uh, now, some of them, of course, within the city and some of them outside the city. Mm -hmm. But there is a reference there in uh, Plutarch about uh, these burials. And people yes. somehow maybe in the early times were a bit afraid of the dead and kept them uh, more outside. Uh, there's a long debate about that, and so uh, we won't. Go, I mean, I'm happy to talk to you about it privately at great length. We will sit down and and uh, in the and have a long lunch in Sparta someday. But the um, there's been a lot of, that the idea that the Greeks feared interactions with the dead looks a little bit more complicated to sustain now that there's really good evidence for bar intramural burials, not just in Sparta but in places like Argos. So. Uh, that it's not evident that the that at least some Greeks were really afraid of that sort of thing. Uh, and I would add, just as an aside, and, and perhaps Polly would want to talk about that, my sense is that the burial evidence from Attica, not in Athens itself, but in the deems and the villages outside, now shows the and a lot of the deems shows burials being interspersed amongst the habitation areas. So even in Athens, it looks like people, the living and the dead, were, uh, were situated in very close conjunction to each other a lot of the time. So the idea that Greeks feared contact with the dead is not necessarily very evident from the archeological evidence. 